You're watching the Sports Objective, the podcast for Pirates. You're listening to Absolute Empowerment with Coach Jeff Connors on the Sports Objective. Join Coach C, the USA Strength and Conditioning Hall of Famer, every Monday night to see in a variety of guests, including former players, former and current coaches, pastors, and others will discuss relevant issues in coaching today's athlete with the goal of equipping the athlete and those coaching them with the physical, mental, and spiritual armor necessary to live their best life. Here's Coach Connors. Uh, welcome to Absolute Empowerment. I'm Coach Jeff Connors, and tonight with us we have Dr. Pat Ivey, uh, who we are very privileged to have in the house. Uh, Dr. Ivey is an Assistant Vice President, Associate Athletic Director for Health and Performance at the University of Louisville. Uh, welcome to the show, Dr. Ivey. Coach Connors, it's a pleasure to be with you. Yes, sir. Well, the uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to kind of uh, give you a couple objectives first uh, in relationship to, I guess you could say, my mission with, with this show. Uh, and the first one would be to bring on highly accomplished people with a meaningful testimony of faith through adversity. And uh, so kind of what we want to do is learn a little bit more about you, maybe that people don't know in relationship to uh, young Pat Ivy growing up, how you got interested in athletics, who were your influences, and uh, tell us a little bit about maybe some of the things that you had to overcome to be successful. Well, I appreciate that. I'm going to have to go back a ways, I guess. Um, yes, sir. Coming from, <laughs> coming from Detroit, Michigan. Uh -huh. um, I was the the son of two Southern parents that grew up in the South. <clears throat> Excuse me. My, my dad was a blue collar worker, um, worked at Chrysler, worked in the factories, uh, retired as a truck driver. My mom uh, stayed at home and made sure we were taken care of uh, because it was not the easiest time out in the, the, the city there in, in Detroit, Michigan, but it, sure. academics was something that was always stressed by my parents. My mom always made sure we got our work done. She was always at the school. And so for me, education was drilled into my head, the power and importance of education. I um, obviously got interested in sports and, and there, there's a long story there as well. Um, having, good parents doesn't necessarily make it an easy life for an inner city kid. You know, it's typically the, the ones that don't have the best upbringing kind of run uh, and dictate how things go in the neighborhood. So for me coming from that sort of environment really set me up to be the target of a lot of people and around my age in the neighborhood. So my mom knew that um, she could only take me so far. My dad can only take me so far. They uh, thought that sports would be and football would be an avenue for me to learn how to basically have some um, some self-confidence within myself, learn some some toughness, some work ethic, be around some older, um, productive uh, kids my age and, and be led and mentored by some coaches that were strong um and, and positive influences so that's how i got started i got started playing football eventually went to high school went to cast technical high school which is uh downtown detroit michigan and academics like i said was a big part of what i was um a part of and then went to college and i wanted to play college ball i was going to be a defensive end so i had the size i had the speed i had the tenacity and I knew academically I can handle it. So I chose the University of Missouri, played there, had a chance to play professional, played for four different NFL teams, the Chargers, Lions, Broncos, and Packers. And then I got into coaching. As a matter of fact, I started as a graduate assistant at the University of Missouri, working with uh, Dave Tobe, Donnie Summer, Bob Jones. While I was still a professional athlete, I was – a graduate assistant. So either interning or a graduate assistant because I knew what I wanted to do. I wanted to, I wanted to coach. I wanted to make an impact on young people the way my coaches did in little league on East side, Cowboys, Cast Tech, 
uh, technicians, Coach Roland. So these men were very strong, influential in my life, and that's something I wanted to do to give back. So I became a college strength and conditioning coach, did yeah. that for a long time, and then knew I wanted to get into administration, and that's where I am now. Gotcha. Uh, we'll talk a little bit more about your uh, career in strength and conditioning. Of course, that's that's how I met you. And, uh, you know, I was always uh, glad to see you at the conferences because you were always very uh, cordial and friendly. And uh, I always appreciate you. And it was great to see you at Ohio State here recently. Uh, so uh, with this podcast, I, I don't know who's, you know, who my next uh, interview is going to be. I just kind of let God lead me a little bit. Uh, but I'm very appreciative to have you on. And so uh, in relationship to your experience with strength and conditioning, uh, what were some of the things that you learned about athletes or some of your experiences that kind of uh, led you kind of in a little bit of a different direction in relationship to different ways to influence them even beyond being a strength and conditioning coach? That's a really good question. By having coaches that knew the importance of sport in our lives, where I came from, like they knew it was bigger than sport. It was bigger than football. It was bigger than what happened on the field. They knew that what they were doing was going to impact lives. And then that was very apparent um, from every, from high school, same thing. Uh, the head coach there, we would actually have to get in line and show him our report card. And if you're, if you had any uh, D's or F's, it was not going to be a good day for you. Yeah. So that, that instilled in me the importance of academics to the point that even when I was a strength and conditioning coach, when great reports came out, I would tell my coaches, I'm not coaching today. I'm talking to each one of these players about their grades and I would have their grades. And I would say, Explain to me what's going on here. You know, if you had a 3.5, explain to me. Coach, yeah, I, I've got to get that 1B up. Like, good, get that 1B up. You should be about a 3.7. You know, all the way to the one that had uh, a few of those not so good grades, few Ds, few Fs. Like, you got to explain this to me. And so just knowing that that this is bigger than football, this is bigger than sport what was instilled in me by my mom and dad, by my coaches, the type of coach that I wanted to be. And I had an experience as a young coach that I did not want any of my assistants to experience. And so I made a promise and I actually prayed. I made a prayer. I said, God, if, if uh, I want to be a director of strength and conditioning, and if I treat any of my assistants the way I'm being treated, then take it all from me. I don't need it. I don't want to do it. And the same thing goes for if I mistreat any of the athletes, it needs to go. And, and I knew that I would not break that promise because of that pact I made that if I didn't treat people right and with respect, that it would all be taken away. But I wanted that accountability because I wanted to be the best version of me that I could be. I wanted to be the type of coach that I wanted when I was an athlete. So I had coaches that I wanted. Then by the time I got to college, I had some coaches that I didn't uh, right. want to replicate and be around or, or want anything to do with. And so I had both versions. I had versions of coaches that I wanted to emulate. And I had versions that I will never do those things to my staff or the athletes that I work with. And so that drove me for many years. Right. Well, you know, I think everybody knows that we're all, you know, we all have been in a very tough profession, a very vulnerable profession. And, uh, you know, I've seen so many coaches through my career go by the wayside and then, you know, I never hear from them again. I've got some of those guys. And then, uh, you know, I was very fortunate to, you know, uh, survive seven head coaches. And, and then basically uh, when I got out, I was, I was, fortunately, I was financially secure, but, you know, I was too old to go find another job. So uh, so I started to have, you know, I had this podcast, but um, I want to give you a couple more objectives uh, of what I'm trying to do here. The second one, and I also have a website called armorlife.org and kind of a uh, armored life team of 
uh, for, you know, uh, players that are now pastors uh, who I have tons of respect for and I've had on my podcast uh, along with the guys that I coached that, that were played in the league and so forth and also coaches. But uh, to create pathways of resolution and success for the troubled athlete, this is uh, when I first retired and I thought, you know, I got a little spot down at the beach and, you know, it's going to be nice. Maybe I'll just go down and go fish and play a little bit of golf. And then all of a sudden, uh, something hit me in the side of the head and said, you know, how many, how many players did you see not make it to their senior year? How many players by the wayside for one reason or another, and some reasons a lot more common than other reasons. And, you know, I'm going to go through the list with you today, but yeah, these, these are things that uh, really bothered me during my career. But being so busy, I really didn't know how I could help, you know, in some respects. I was, you know, trying to win the next game. But, uh, you know, just to see guys, uh, you know, I know that I saw 150 people leave a program for smoking marijuana, you know. Uh, just And I, I bring that up all the time because it just uh, – it's something that I think about a lot, you know, because they, you know, a lot of those guys were very good football players. And uh, so where all that's concerned, uh, what, give me a little bit of, of your opinion, you know, your experience with regard to the troubled athlete. Yeah, that's, I think any coach, that wants to be the best coach they can be wants to reach every athlete on the team. Yeah. And that's your all-star athlete, your yes, sir, no, sir, athlete, all the way to the one that doesn't understand their shoes need to be tied and, and socks need to be properly pulled up and, and pants and all those things. And you want to reach every one of them. And sometimes the ones that are the hardest to reach present the most challenge, but also we know the most rewarding once we get them to see the light. Right. And and, and I think, um, you know, coach, I think that's, that's what I think of when I, when I think of you. So when you want to, when I spoke to you at a conference, you were someone that I recognized you were trying to reach every athlete. We can talk about playlists and songs and you would, you would say, Hey, if you got some playlists for me, get them to me because <laughs> I know that was important to you. You were trying to make sure you reached every one of your athletes. And if, if yeah. there were songs out there, you know, that that you could play in the weight room that could get a young man's attention, then you knew you could have a better chance to win that athlete. So that, that's what it's about. It's about how can you win each one of those athletes over? Because it's is yeah, you need yeah, you need them to be the best version they can be as an athlete. So because yeah, we need to win games. Yes, we want to keep our job, but you you've been doing it and I have been doing it long enough that we gotten return on the investment, meaning those young men would come back to the weight room and we would see what they had become. We would see their families, we would see uh the jobs that they would hold, how they would take care of their families financially. Like we had we were able to do it long enough to be able to see it. And we were doing it long enough to be able to know the ones where we poured and invested so much into, we got to see that product. And that's what kept us going. And that's what keeps you going, wanting to do this podcast. That's what keeps me going, wanting to be the guest on your podcast. Because there are still people to reach and there are athletes that still need to hear our voice. Well, I really... Uh... You know, I just I have a lot of respect for and uh, I, I guess I'm trying to, to figure out how to express this. But when a strength coach like yourself finds another avenue to stay in a position to influence people somehow, you know, I mean, it's maybe it's it's some degree good fortune, but it's it's how you pursued your education. It's how you pursued your contacts and relationships with people. Uh, they would, would have created positions for you that are very meaningful. And, uh, you know, I have a lot of respect for you for what you've accomplished. Uh, I, don't, I can't even name all the titles you've had different places. I mean, I, I went through your bio and I was like, 
I'm going to have to let him talk about his bio because, you know, it's, it's too deep for me, but, uh, and I think there's some other people across the country that uh, are, you know, have kind of gravitated to those positions. And so uh, I think it's just really good for the profession. Like if you, okay, if you don't win enough games, okay, well, they want to bring in a new regime. Okay. You're out. It's really nice when they can find a place for you. If you really have a passion and desire to help young people. And, and I hope more of that occurs across the country in programs where people can actually, uh, you know, find the, uh, these types of or create these types of positions because strength coaches, uh, you know, you're in the trenches all day long. You have a ton of insight in relationship to at least a lot of strength coaches have a lot of insight in relationship to how to continue to relate to people uh, beyond just sets and reps. And, uh, you know, and I, I personally took that very seriously in my whole career, uh, but uh a uh, props to you, man, in what you've accomplished and in what you've actually created as, as far as, uh, may, you know, maybe a potential avenue for other strength coaches in the future as well. So I think it's awesome. Well, I appreciate uh, that. Couple, couple other, uh, I'll just give you a couple other objectives to the podcast. Uh, Want to collect specific information for, from former athletes and coaches that uh, has meaningful impact for current athletes. So. With regard to these podcasts, you know, I'm, I'm trying to uh, I want to get more young people to listen to some guys that have had experience as NFL players, as NFL coaches, collegiate coaches, whatever, so that uh, they can get more insight. And, in, you know, the things that are important and how they can continue to be successful. And, uh, you know, when when you talk about those things, you're, you're looking at choices, uh, relationships. And also things such as loyalty, integrity, and humility. And uh, even with the, the way it is now with, uh, you know, all the new stuff that, that came down the line uh, with money, I, you know, I guess that uh, loyalty is still important, although I can't blame somebody for wanting to make some money. Uh, but at the same time, you know, you, you have to have a certain degree of loyalty to a program, you know, as well, I, I think. So it's – it's a tough deal. You know, it's, it's challenging, you know, so, uh, um, but be primary objective is to be a resource uh, for a new or renewed spiritual commitment with regard to uh, a collegiate athlete specifically. Um, Cause I think a lot of times, you know, we put our spiritual life on timeout when we go to college and uh, you know, I'm, I'm to the point now I don't work for a university. So I, if I want to talk about Jesus Christ, I'm going to do it. And that's what I've been talking about. So, uh, you know, I really believe that uh, it's extremely important for a collegiate athlete to have a spiritual life and, uh, you know, uh, just have a good foundation for making great choices. And that way, you know, get to graduation, be successful, uh, listen to the right people, make the right choices. So, and, you know, I'm pretty much assuming these are the things that you talk about with athletes all the time. Absolutely. I, I think faith and, and, you know, we know we have to be careful in these, especially at a public institution sure. about how you go about it. But you know that faith is important. You know that spirituality, a person's spirituality is important and they may have different backgrounds and where they're from. And I think it's important to respect those different backgrounds, yeah. respect those different spiritual um, preferences and, and, and where people are coming from. I, I can tell you at the, here at the university of Louisville, Chris Morgan, who heads up our FCA, um, program, I've never seen anything like it. He has on average, uh, two to 300 student athletes at each one of his meetings. Right. And, and he's got a staff of, unbelievable people like he's got a diverse staff so athletes can see different backgrounds and uh genders ethnicity so they can they can see people that they can relate to so that's that's pretty cool that 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 can happen at a public institution um but we know that athletes need something beyond what they receive 
in just normal society. We know that they we can't just we're focused on their their nutrition and their their strength and conditioning. Their we want to make sure they're good socially. We want to make sure they're uh, the mental side. That's become a big part: mental health and mental performance. But the spirituality of an athlete is important, and a lot of them. That's how they grew up. And then once they get to our campus, if we're not encouraging that they continue to do or be a part of what made them successful, then I think we 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 fall short. And we want to make sure that we can encourage that that they can continue to grow as a person um, in every facet. Right. Yeah, and I mean, you know, there's uh, a large number of athletes that I coached, uh, you know, came from certain homes. And, um, you know, I talked to uh, Rod Coleman, played in the league about nine years ago. I coached Carl Williams I talked to here recently, the D-line coach for the Titans. And, you know, he came from South Central L.A. Rod came from Philly. And, you know, we were talking a whole a lot about strong grandmas and, uh, you know, how impactful strong grandmas are. Uh, but, uh, you know, what – what is your perspective in relationship to uh, is, is there some program promoting fatherhood? Is there some program uh, like what, what do you do in your program? Do you talk about that at all in your program? Let me go backwards a little bit and talk about my time at the university of Missouri. Um, something Gary Pinkle, who was just inducted into the National Football Hall of Fame this past December, something that he had acknowledged and come to the realization on is that there was a widening gap of players on the team with those who came from households and backgrounds with strong uh, male figures whether it's an uncle or a father or a grandfather, and then those that didn't. And, and, and I noticed it as well. And we had the conversation that we need to do something different for those players that come from those sorts of backgrounds where they didn't have that sort of presence in the home. Because when they get here and they're listening to us give out instructions and in, we're talking a language about discipline and accountability and attention to detail. And it's coming from us. It's not being received like it should be based on uh, athletes that may have come from a background where they have been used to hearing that sort of voice. And, yeah. and, and so he asked for help. Like, how are we going to do this? We need to identify who these athletes are early in the program and then come up with some sort of programming that can give them what they need. And, and so I think that is still very relevant today. Uh, I think we do need to do a better job. We, we need to do a better job of onboarding freshmen as they come transfers as they come. But I think, some sort of program we need to go even further farther and i agree with you um something that we can do to talk about what fatherhood is uh and what it means to us and maybe share our stories i think can go a long way with our student athletes well i think about one young man all the time uh who i i asked him to come to my office once a week and talk to me and we talked about you know, everything from when he was growing up and all the things that he went through and so forth. Cause he was struggling. It was, he was troubled, but he was like my you know, MVP of strength and conditioning testing. You know, I mean, uh, he was that guy and played uh, defensive back. And then, uh, you know, after uh, he had graduated or left the program, you know, maybe a year later, he got gunned down in a, parking lot of a mall, you know, and as a, I, I don't know, maybe 23 years old. Uh, I still think about that a whole lot. You think about, you know, is there anything I could have said different? Is there anything, is something I could have done? You know, I mean, but uh, so, you know, those are the type, types of things that really, you know, motivate me to do something like this because I, I still, you know, that still hits me hard. Yeah. 
And, uh, you know, and, and I know there's people out there that we can help. Yeah. And so, uh, kind of moving down the line here, uh, and just talking about a few other things. Uh, how about the, the, the uh, impact of playing time or let's say not getting playing time? Um, do you counsel with people there? You know, that that has continued to evolve and change. You now have parents who want more input at a higher level, meaning college, yeah. uh, into playing time. You have these services out there now that are, you know, you used to have to wait until the day after a game to get your grade on how you played from your coach. Maybe it was posted in the locker room before you had the meeting. So you knew how you graded out with your percentage yeah. of, of whether at the point of attack or whatever, making plays or mistakes. Well, they've got these services out now that are uh, over the internet and they're giving you a grade on how you played. So how do you as a coach combat wow. what you're hearing, what, what your player – your athletes are being told either on Twitter, internet, social media, these other services, parents, mm. um, NIL agents, uh, yeah. all these, uh, you know, everyone is a, has an opinion out. Everyone has access to, uh, you know, these chat rooms. Like there, there's a lot to navigate as a coach. And I think what we can do better is teaching our athletes distraction control. What's a distraction? Like, can any of these things and any of these opinions actually change your level of competence and confidence so that you can go out and execute and, and make these plays that you need to make? Because if you make plays, you're going to get playing time. Like that's yeah. what it comes down to. You do your job and you do yeah. it consistent, consistently well, you're going to get playing time. And I think a lot of them have had people, so many people involved in their path up until, the, until they get to college that those people are still in place and still want to have a voice with that athlete and have had that. It makes it really difficult for a coach. And yeah. I think what you have to do is set boundaries. You have to set guidelines. All right. This is how I will interact with your parents. I expect you to be a young adult. I expect for you to be um, someone who knows how to communicate um, someone who knows how to be accountable. And if you have any issues, let's deal with it. It, but it's not easy. Right. Uh well, let's move on to, um, I guess, another elephant in the room for the last 50 years, uh, you know, alcohol in the club. So <laughs> Steve Logan uh, yeah, was kind of interesting back in the, you know, the early 90s when I was at East Carolina, you know, the, uh, the head coach decided – his own parties at hotels and hire a DJ and require people to come there instead of downtown. So that was, uh, that was an interesting, uh, uh, sequence of events. <laughs> and, uh, you know, but you gotta, you do what you gotta do to, you know, to keep people out of trouble. But, uh, do, do you think, uh, we're doing better with that in educating, uh, athletes to kind of avoid those situations where you know there's going to be trouble i think so i think yeah. we are and i don't know if if we have to do as much education as their lived experiences tell them that what they do is probably going to be captured in some kind of way because everyone has a cell phone that has a camera on it there are cameras everywhere there are ring cameras, security cameras. You can't go anywhere, just really anywhere, without uh, someone knowing or being able to prove that you were there. So I think they've learned, and I think that is um, 
something that has maybe hurt them socially because what we used to do back in the day when when you had a little bit of stress you say i'm gonna go what blow off what some steam yep right like how you go blow off steam now like right someone's gonna have a camera right in your face while you're blowing off steam how does that look like yeah if, if someone would have recorded us blowing off steam back in the day we wouldn't be here yeah like and so um I think th we don't have to do as much education with them on what are the social ramifications of you making a mistake. I think um, what we want to spend more time doing is in the privacy, in your own privacy, making sure you're making best, better, the best decisions, because I don't think they can go out to the club like like we used to go out like even yeah. 15 years ago. So I think educating them on the um, the consequences and, and what happens when you do drink alcohol. We used to have a, an equation. We would, um, it was um, one equals two, two equals five. And one equals two means one night of drinking is going to cost you two days of recovery. Yeah. Two nights in a row is going to cost you five. So yeah. I'll let you all do the math and you figure out how you want to do this. So hopefully if they did do something, it may have been for one night, not two nights in a row. And maybe it would, maybe they, and we used to also educate them. Hey, drink water too. Like yeah. uh, I'm going to keep it real with you. I know you all are going to go out. One equals what? Two, two equals what? Five drink water too. And then, I thought I think that helped a, a lot of the athletes that uh, and I had a really good nose as well. Like I could yeah. I, could, I could smell something, get you nice and <laughs> sweaty and lathered up. Hey, bring it in real close, real, real close after, I've, you know, we've gotten after it in the warm up. And um, yeah, you're going to be able to pick something up. Yeah, don't forget the burn marks on the lips either, you know. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you know, finger looking at finger. Yeah, I've looked at fingernails before. I've looked at um, yeah, your eyes. Your eyes, they're an organ. Your lips are an organ. So if you're putting certain things in, your organs have to get those toxins out, and they're going to yeah. be discolored or they're going to look dehydrated. Um, so I will use all of that to, and, and it's not to embarrass an athlete. It is to let them know, hey, the decisions you're making are detrimental to your performance and your progress. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you know, I asked you for those playlists, cause you know, the back when I, I played was in the you know late seventies, it was earth, wind and fire, you know, all those, those, you know, we, when we went out, all we did was dance, you know, like for four hours. So, you know, it was like another workout by the time we got <laughs> home. So that's how that went, but things have changed a lot. Yes, they did. Yes, they did. <laughs> uh, so, how about managing the daily schedule? This is something that, you know, always intrigued me in relationship to how many things these guys had to do in the course of a day uh, with regard to study hall and, you know, of course, early morning lift. And then, then if you had winter conditioning and then you had lifting after winter conditioning and then, you, you know, you had classes and so forth, then you try to eat sometime, uh, you know, uh, do you all have a, an intricate plan there to help folks? Uh, I think with that's one of the benefits of technology is that you're yeah. able to kind of plan out, help someone stay organized and, and you know, using the, the use of calendar. We use what we call Teamworks and Teamworks. You can enter your class schedule, study hall times and any other um, anything else you want to enter. I right. spoke to a group of athletes a few years ago and they wanted to know how do you stay better organized. And, and I don't think they asked that, but they talked about having so many things to do. And I asked them about what is their organizational processes. And I would say, hey, show me, you, everyone has a phone, show me where on your phone, where you have to be and what you have to get done. And they couldn't do it. It's like, yeah. what's the point of having it? So this one athlete who's very successful had three different calendars, a calendar that the, the team had sent, a calendar uh, for his the academics sent, 
and then his own calendar and none of them synced up. So they athletes were finding themselves double booked and not knowing it. So I think if we can teach them time management, how to best plan out your day, what I would do is I would pick every year. I would pick two every, you know, going into the summer, I would pick two or three athletes that I knew had their stuff figured out. And yeah. we would, I would have them get with someone on staff and put an Excel spreadsheet that showed their schedule from Sunday to Saturday when they woke up, when they had breakfast, lunch, dinner, when they had snacks, when they went to sleep, when did they take a nap, when did they train, lift, class, study hall. And we would put that up on the board and you would just see athletes just studying it because because these were going to be our future draft picks. Right. Like, this is what he does. And athletes would be like, Coach, can I get a copy of Xavier's <laughs> yeah. schedule? It, it was amazing to see. And I said, hey, if you all need help and you want to, you want your schedule, you want to plan it out, you know, sit down with one of the coaches. We can help you with that. And so just doing little things like that, I think, make a big difference. Right. Yeah, and of course, you know, especially since uh, attending the clinic, uh, clinic at Ohio State uh, and looking at all the different restoration methods, uh high level restoration methods and high level research, of course, being done there with regard to that uh, sleep, of course, being one of the primaries. And that's something people have been talking about here for the last few years. Uh, every athlete there having the aura ring, uh, which I guess provides uh, all kinds of different feedback to them and the, to the coaching staff and so forth. And, and, you know, this is good stuff. And, you know, I've, but I, I kind of was in my head when they start first start talking about readiness and, you know, do, does this mean like as coaches, we have to change our program for people if we think that like they're not ready, you know, cause back in the day, the whole resolution was, well, if I didn't think, think you slept well, I'd work you that much harder to remind you to sleep tomorrow night. So it's a little different now. So, uh, how much does this information actually impact the training prescription for that day or that week or, you know, well, how's that work? I, I tried to go that route with coach Pinkle <laughs> and he said, so these athletes are doing more than they have the ability to recover from. And I said, yes. He said, well, they just need to do all the stuff that you're telling them to do. If they need to be eating right, sleeping right, hydrating right, that's on them. And I couldn't argue with them. Like, yeah, yeah coach, you, you're right. Um, so that was the last time I went to him about asking if we could manage any sort of load or anything like that. Um, yeah. You know, that was on the players. Now, we, we did – use the Omega wave system, which did look at rate readiness and different biological systems and HRV and things like that. And we had one particular athlete. He was a junior college transfer. We didn't bring in too many. We brought, we would bring in maybe two, no more than three ju junior college players. Yeah. And this, this athlete was a future first round draft pick. And we were going to have him. We, he had three to play three. He ended up playing two going, coming out as a junior. And, um, we had him in season. We after the first game, we put him on the Omega Wave, and we were only testing about ten of our players, ten eleven, because it, it takes time and you got to put them in a in a room and quiet room yeah. and all that stuff. And we said, "Hey, you're red." It was so it was a Sunday, like you're is red, yellow, green. You're red. Most of your teammates are yellow. And I said, "Look, I'm not going to ask you what you did." after the game because I know what you did during the game. I'm not going to ask you what you did after the game. What I am going to say is whatever you did put you further behind than the rest of your teammates to recover. So I'm guessing it's going to be you. So your Mon your Sunday's gone, your Monday's gone, your Tuesday's gone. You might recover by Wednesday. Yeah. And, and, and and he said, you can tell that? I said, yes. I said, look, I, this is between us. But 
if you, with your potential, if you continue like that, you won't be who you can be. You won't be the player you can be. And he said, coach, that'll never happen again. I said, it's on you. Yeah. After that, we tested him every Sunday. He came back the most ready out of any of his teammates. For, he was playing at the first round draft pick level. There were times he would come back at green on Sunday. We were like, how did you do that? Like, I said, look, that's, that's cool. However, I was like, look, do me a favor. You're a very influential person on this team. Talk to your teammates that might be coming back in the red. Let them know what, what's going on and tell them how you're coming back in the green because we can't put everybody through this. But you've got the influence and you know. And sure enough, I mean, we had a pretty good year. Yeah. Well, you know, I've, I've run into some interesting characters along the way. At, at UNC, I had a kid that was a defensive back that uh, he went and played in the league probably four or five years with two, you know, two teams. And uh, I think he showed up a lot of days uh, still inebriated and would go out and win every rep somehow, whether it was a 400 or 200, it didn't matter. He was going to win. So it, the kid just uh, amazed me. <laughs> yeah. But uh, every once in a while, you'll find somebody like that. Yep. Uh, so I had Dr. Rick Perea on, you know, and I don't know if you're familiar with with Dr. Uh, Perea, but, you know, he's uh, he's got a podcast. He's a sports psychologist, real big into this stuff, work with the Broncos and the Dolphins and so forth. But really uh, had a lot of points relative to marijuana uh, to – you know, support the fact it's very destructive, you know, even though it's been legalized several places. But uh, how do you educate the athletes with regard to that? And obviously it's still against the NCAA rules, correct? Uh, it is. And it's it becomes more difficult because I think a year ago they raised the limit from 35 nanoliters to 150. So – basically saying that you can still do something or be around it and and there's and still not be above the threshold so that coming from the ncaa sends kind of a mixed message yeah. um, and you know then there's the legalization of it then is it medicinal um i think for us we there's education out there you can talk to them but here, here, let me give you an example. Um, so I went back to school to get my doctorate in sports psychology. And so I started studying different aspects of the brain and how it works and, and how you could get the most out of, out of your physical body. And we decided we would try something during training camp. We found a three minute meditation, uh, mindfulness guided meditation. And I said, I was thinking to myself, these guys are probably going to laugh us out of the out of the weight room. Um, I said, but you know what? I'm willing to try it. So after practice, we would come in and lift and lifting during training camp. You know how it is. It's high intensity moving around. I want yeah. you in and out in 15, 20 minutes. Um, hit the shower and then you probably got lunch or meetings or something like that. So I said, I'm going to take three minutes. All right. Everybody upstairs. We turned the lights turned the lights off. Everybody lay back. We had some turf up on the um, balcony in the weight room, and for three minutes they went through this guided meditation, and um, the the it ended, and they were still laying down, and we we're like, like what do we do? Like I don't know. Uh, hey guys, you got to get up and go. You know, hit the shower. You got meetings, and some of them had fallen asleep in less than three minutes yeah and i just stood there as they were passing by getting ready to go down the stairs and they were just kind of like just still floating i'm like wow what's going on and then the guys that i know the smokers yeah. i know i i you know i know they came up to me like coach we got to do that every time I was like, what, what, what is it? They're like, coach, man, 
we need to do that in the afternoons before we go to meetings too. I'm like, okay, yeah, yeah, sure, absolutely. And it taught me what they were seeking and trying to find shortcuts to serenity. They found in those three minutes in that guided meditation. Yeah. What they were trying to do is reduce the stress. They were trying yeah. to get in the present. And that three minutes got them there. And I know that there were athletes that probably looked for more positive options that would be wouldn't be detrimental to their career because of opportunities that we expose them to, such as guided meditation. Yeah. Well, I mean, do you think that, uh, how do you feel about, uh, I mean, do you feel like that it, it damages the brain or not? Oh, I think it does something. I don't know if we've done enough research on it. I don't know what threshold. Um, I don't know, coach. I mean, I know too much of anything is bad. I don't know what too much is for anybody. Yeah. I can't say that just because somebody took a couple of puffs, they've got brain damage. Like I don't, yeah, I, I, I don't think I can, I've seen anything where I can say that. Um, so I, I would just say there are other, whatever you're trying to accomplish by smoking, are there other options? When you look at all the different factors that affect an athlete, all the different things that we've mentioned, and you know, and I've got probably a list of ten more I could mention, but uh, what do you want to attack first in relationship to helping someone to be successful? When you look at all these different things, uh, where do you want to put your money? As far as like developing athletes? Well, as far as, uh, you know, we could talk about alcohol education, drug education, uh, the daily schedule, money management, uh, yep. play, you know, uh, not becoming angry because you're not getting playing time and, and go jump in the portal. Yep. Uh, I mean, you know, what? I actually wrote a book, Coach. Attack first. Uh, yeah, I, I wrote a book called The Table. And in it is okay. for student athletes. Yeah, in it is for student athletes. And and I talk about choices, choosing your identity, choosing your path, choosing your friends, career choice, education. Then the second theme is character development. So personal development, leadership development, relationships. I talk about money and wealth. Uh, my wife actually wrote the chapter on personal finance. She's a professor investments by a um, former strength coach. Then the final theme is living life, life after sports, focus, family, and passing the baton to teach others. So I, I would say if I'm going to put all of my chips in one area, it is going to be on mental performance. It is going to be teaching someone the skills of how to think right. It is going to be how can I teach you how to be in the present, how to choose positive self-talk over negative self-talk, how to, how to, what is confidence, what's concentration, um, intensity management. Like I'm going to breathing, breath control. I'm going to teach them how to do that because that's going to transcend life. Right. I like it. I need to get a copy of that. <laughs> it's coming i got i got you i got All you right. uh so i guess we got a little bit of time left here but i want to talk about your family oh man i appreciate it and that's that's the reason family is the reason why you and i are connected because we saw each other a few weeks ago at the ohio state strength yeah. and conditioning clinic i my daughter, my oldest daughter goes to Ohio State. She's studying animal science. And yes. I saw that conference come across my email maybe on Wednesday. 
And I thought, wow, it's in Columbus. Opportunity to go spend some time with my daughter. And I said, hey, do you want to go to the conference with me? If she had said no, I don't think I would have went. Yeah. I, I went because I wanted to spend some time with her and I wanted her to have a, a new experience. This is, you know, she doesn't necessarily want to be a strength and conditioning coach, but she wants to train uh, large animals. She wants to work with large animals. So, you know, some of us can be like that and <laughs> some Absolutely. athletes can be like that. But um, it was it was a good experience for her. Um, she's so hardworking, so bright, and it was good just to spend some time with her. I picked her up from her dorm. We went to the conference. We had lunch, uh, and then I dropped her back off at the dorm right after lunch, and I drove back uh, back here to Louisville. My my youngest, she is a senior in high school. She just completed her first book, so she wants to be a novelist. She wants to be an author. Um, talented crocheter. I'm. I mean, I don't understand how she does what, what it is that she does. She, <laughs> she can make anything. And um, and my wife, we've been, wow, it's March already. So this month we'll be married for 26 years. Wow. We met in college. We've been together for 30 years. Um, yeah, man, these 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 ladies in my life are just, man, they're, they're my everything. My um, mom and dad are still together. They've been wow. married for 52 years coming up in August. Um, and we we talk in some kind of form all the time. Um, and then, you know, I've got sisters and younger sister, older sister, older brother. So man, yeah. I've been blessed. I've, I've got an awesome family, so supportive. Um, man, we're so encouraging um, for one another. And that's the that's where my strength comes from is uh, doing everything for them. Well, I'll talk to your daughter a little bit. She seemed to be very sweet. And uh, my wife is uh, someone who loves animals. And I just think there's something special about people who love animals because, you know, you, you can tell right away they have a big heart, you know. Yep. So, uh, uh, <clears throat> you know, we, we got a bunch of them here at my house. So uh, <laughs> <laughs> I try to find a place, you know, in my bed you know, where I got enough room to sleep at night. <laughs> we got two more dogs in there. So, yeah, yeah, we, we've got the dog and, mm. um, yeah, they want another one. I'm like, I, I keep voting no, but I keep getting outvoted. So we'll see. <laughs> well, uh, <laughs> before we wrap it up, uh, just tell me a little bit about your typical day and, uh, you know, what, what you're doing with your, your particular occupation. Oh, wow. Um, no day is the same. Um, so obviously health and performance, and that is, so I'm, I'm the healthcare administ designated healthcare administrator means that means that, um, the team physicians report through that position, that designation, I oversee sports medicine, sports, nutrition, sports, performance, sports, science, mental health, mental performance. I have an administrative assistant, so I oversee 55 people, uh, full-time people. That doesn't include seasonals. That does not include uh, graduate assistants or interns. Right. Uh, it doesn't include any of any of those. And it's a big job. It's um, the largest department in the athletics department. So, and, and we know the type of people that work in those in those. But they're hardworking. Um, dedicated and really, really intelligent. So my job is to make sure they have what they need. And, right. and that takes a lot. It takes a lot of communication, coordination. We say we have three C's, um, care, communicate, collaborate. And so if you care, I want you to care about yourself because if you can't, don't take care of yourself, it's hard to take care of anyone else. Communicate and be a better communicator every day. F verbal, written body language it all matters collaborate if we if you care and you communicate collaboration is going to happen but that all leads to what we call comprehensive integration and that is do we have all of the services and are they all interconnected right and that's important uh your athletes want to know if your strength coaches are talking to nutritionists nutritionists are talking to uh the athletic trainers athletic trainers are talking to the sports scientists 
uh, talking the mental health people are talking to the team doctors like it's we've all got to be connected and on the same page so my day starts with emails text messages early in the morning i wake up and get a walk i walk my dog i get a walk and a jog come back hit the sun hit the gym um, i've got a home gym right here and then i have to i make breakfast shower then i'm out the door I'm making phone calls, emails uh, before I get to work. Um, I have to prepare for a Monday on a Sunday. I, I put all my agendas together early Sunday morning for the week. I go through my schedule. I spend probably half a Sunday morning doing all of that. Um, Monday, I start off, I meet with the mental health staff. I'll stop by those offices. I'll meet with my administrative assistant, go through my agenda for the rest of the week. And then I'll meet with our nutrition of ops to make sure uh, she has everything that she needs. Then I get to my, then I go to my office. Right. So and once I get to my office, <laughs> it's about 10 o'clock. Now I'll meet with my supervisor and I'll go through the agenda that I prepared that I send her on Sunday. I'll go through the entire week. We'll go through the things that I need her assistance on and I'll go back to my office and then I'll, start banging out whatever we had on the yeah. agenda um lunch and then there's meetings for the rest of the afternoon um tuesday a little bit more of the same i'll have my health and big health and performance meeting with all my directors at 11 o'clock um i make sure i schedule lunch every day uh, and then there's more meetings in the afternoon by same thing. So Wednesday morning, I'll have the senior staff meeting or our leadership meeting that alternates every other week. And then usually by that afternoon, I can finally start to get out to practices, get to the weight rooms, see some athletes, see the people that I um, supervise. And that's usually my my Wednesday. Thursday is uh, probably meetings with the hospital system campus people in the community um that's usually thursday then friday morning i'll i'll do my personal business uh before i leave the house uh, like i've got pativy.com and things like that and then i'm adjunct I'm adjunct professor as well so i take care of that yeah. stuff usually uh mid friday morning then i'll get to the get to campus this Friday. I'll travel with the men's basketball team. So I'll probably get to campus afternoon, travel with the team that evening. We got game day on Saturday. I'll get back Saturday night. Sunday, we've got a group um, of developers that'll be here. So I'll show them on a campus tour, yeah. take them to dinner on Sunday night. And yeah, wake up Monday morning, do it all over again. Well, I want to congratulate you on your, all your success and uh, the wonderful role model you are for other people in, in the profession. And, uh, you know, and, and it's it's still a pretty tough profession, but I'm I'm really glad to see people getting paid now like they should be getting paid. Yes. And uh, so it's been really great. Uh, great seeing you at Ohio State and, and getting up with you again. And hey, let's. Uh, Let's stay in touch. Absolutely. Appreciate you, Coach. Thank you for everything you've done in the profession. Thank you for being continuing to be a role model for coaches like me because we need this. We need this avenue. We need this community. We need this fellowship. Yeah. Uh, it's what, what drove us to be who we were. We're still that. So we yeah. still need each other. Very well stated. Well, hey, this is Jeff Connors uh, signing off for Absolute Empowerment. Uh, we'll see you all next week, and God bless. Thanks a lot, Dr. Pat Ivey. Thank you. You've been listening to Absolute Empowerment with Coach Jeff Connors on the Sports Objective. Join us every Monday night for a new edition of the show. Listen to the show pretty much everywhere podcasts are found. Be sure to follow us on social media at the Sports OBJ on Twitter and TikTok, at the Sports Objective on Instagram. Like and follow our Facebook page and subscribe to our YouTube channel. 
As always, we appreciate you listening to the show, and go Pirates!